But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of, east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provide, provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening. Um, It's great to be with you. If you don't know me, my name's Tim. I'm the curate here at St. Michael's, and it's a real joy um, to be gathered with you in worship this evening as we conclude the book of Jonah that we've been looking at in this mini-sermon series. It's been a ride. I hope it didn't give you too much of a sinking feeling. It's that kind of night, isn't it? Okay, yeah, just, just gauging the room, gauging the room. Um, so um, before we dive into looking at the conclusion of Jonah, if it is a conclusion, and we'll come to that a bit later on, shall we recap the story so far? So in the beginning of the book of Jonah, we're introduced to Jonah ben Amittai, which is a name which roughly translates as Dove Son of Faithfulness. And this name really sets the tone for the book, Because unlike a dove which is set to soar in the skies majestically, Jonah, the dove, is going to sink into the depths of the ocean and despair. And rather than being a son of faithfulness, this prophet of God is about as unfaithful as you can get, running away from God again and again and refusing to allow his character to be conformed with the God who has called him into his vocation. This is a book which is filled from beginning to end with people and things not reacting how you would expect them to. It turns everything on its head. So in chapter one, we see um, that God's prophet runs away. The one who's meant to be um, speaking God's words to the people flees from his presence. And yet the pagan sailors repent of their wrongdoing and worship God. In um, chapter 2, we see that God rescues Jonah. And yet, unlike the pagan sailors, Jonah refuses to repent and instead recites scripture correctly, but does not apologize or even admit um, fault. He shows he knows all the right answers, but he's unwilling to enter into a personal relationship. And in chapter 3, we see Jonah preaches what I think may well go down as the worst gospel message in history. He just says again and again, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. It's no, no three-point sermon, no nice story about his kids. That's it. 40 days, you're being overthrown. 
Bosch. And yet even more amazingly, this wicked city with this international reputation for being a horrendous place where evil things happen, do repent. The king who is mighty and power crazed humbles himself. All the people, including the cattle, dress in rags and cover themselves um, um, with sackcloth, repenting of their wrongdoing. And God responds to that. And this all brings us this weird and wonderful story where everything is turned upside down and no one behaves how you'd expect them to, to Jonah chapter 4. Are you with me so far? Great. Um, does anyone recognize this film? Yeah, sh shout it out. Go on. Thank you. Fight Club. Well, someone this morning, I think it was John, responded with, uh, the first rule of that film is we can't talk about that film. So I thought that's quite a witty response. Very good. Yep. Yep. Very good. And, um, um, but now I've got a bit of a confession in that um, I've never actually seen the last 10 minutes of Fight Club. I know. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, I began to watch it in the early 2000s, I think, on DVD or VHS and sat down to watch it. And then something happened. I, I didn't have time for the last few minutes. I went out, never got round to it. Um, and I've been told that this is the kind of rather key bit of the film, which makes sense of the rest. This is the moment in the plot which is key for interpreting the whole. Never seen it. I mean, I've... Well, at some point, I'm sure, but apparently it changes the whole nature of the film once you understand what's going on. I might get around to it at some point, but in the meantime, it's quite a good sermon illustration, so I might just avoid it for the time, time being. But in Jonah chapter 4, I think in chapter 4 verse 2, we're given a glimpse into the moment in the book of Jonah which makes sense, if sense is to be made, of this whole weird and wonderful book if Jonah does have a point and it's a satire it's full of weird and wonderful things but I think it does have a rather searing edge to it then the point can be found by understanding what's going on there but before we dive into Jonah chapter 4 and um, we flick a bit further back in the Bible for me as we um, turn back to Exodus 34 um, you can see it up on the screens here this is the most quoted bit of the Old Testament by the rest of the Old Testament. By that standard, this is an extremely important bit of scripture. You find it in the Psalms, you find it in the prophets, you find it in the New Testament, you find it again and again because this is the moment in the big story of God, the first moment where God reveals who he is and what he is like. This is God's self-revelation. If you want to know what God's like, this is his summary of who he is. So this really matters. Um, so if you don't want to hear anything else this evening, just hear these words and know this is what God is like. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. I don't know what your experience of God has been. I don't know what churches you've been that may have said things contrary to that about the nature of God. But the scripture is consistent. If you want to know what God is like, God defines himself as the Lord, the Lord. First and foremost, before anything else, he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That is the God we gather to Worship. That is one of the key bits of scripture if you want to understand who God is. And with that ringing in our ears, um, let's get back to the book of Jonah. Um, and let's look at the moment in the plot which is key for interpreting the whole. Because back in chapter one of Jonah, we are told, you probably remember from a number of weeks ago, um, that we, we're told that Jonah runs away. He flees from the presence of of God. But I don't know if you picked up on this. That the, the book of Jonah never actually tells us at this moment why he's fleeing from God. Why is it that he feels he needs to run away to Tarshish, which is the equivalent to saying Timbuktu, the other side of the world? Why is he running away? We're left asking our own questions. Is it perhaps that Jonah's a bit too scared 
um, that he, he doesn't want to risk death or injury to himself. Is that why he's running away from God? Um, is it that he's not sure of God's character? He doesn't know if he can trust God to be faithful as he goes on this difficult and dangerous mission. Or maybe that he's worried that if he goes to Nineveh, like he's been asked, that the people won't hear and respond to the message he's preaching. Could it be any of these things that stop Jonah from going to Nineveh? But if we flick forward to today's reading, to Jonah 4, 2, we find out exactly in Jonah's own words why it was that he ran from God's presence. You see, we see throughout the book of Jonah that multiple times Jonah is more than willing to die. He gets the sailors to throw him into the sea, being willing to place his blood on their hands because that way he'll stay from getting to Nineveh. We see later on in this passage today that Jonah will say that he's angry enough to die and pleads with God to take his life. If you think you've got a dramatic person in your family, I guarantee that Jonah will out do them. He really goes um, for it. Um, But I think he means it as well. Jonah's not afraid of death. Um, We also see that Jonah is fully aware of God's character. He knows the scriptures. We see that in chapter two and in chapter four. We see that he absolutely knows by rote the true definition of God's character. He knows exactly what God is like, that he is first and foremost merciful and compassionate and what's more that Jonah knows that God is outraged enough to have mercy and compassion on those that Jonah doesn't consider are worthy of God's mercy and compassion ignoring the irony that Jonah throughout this book receives God's mercy and compassion despite the fact he clearly doesn't seem to deserve it but there's one more thing as well Jonah was fully aware because of this that the people may well repent and listened to what he had to say and these were the reasons these were the reasons he didn't want to go to Nineveh this is why he fled to Timbuktu or Tarshish to try and get away because he knew exactly what God was like and he knew that if people showed any sign of repentance God would blooming well go and forgive them Chapter 4 begins with a sentence um, saying just how angry, seething with rage that Jonah actually is. The Hebrew translates something like the idea that he was burning up with anger. He was furious at what God had done in forgiving this people who in his mind did not deserve compassion. Um, So why is it? Why is it? Is the key question as we dive into chapter 4 that Jonah was burning up with rage. Well, I think from reading between the lines of this story, there are two main reasons. The first is this, that in Jonah's mind, God is compassionate and gracious to those that Jonah is convinced do not deserve such a response. There are people who Jonah has mentally excluded from being um, worthy of God's forgiveness and grace. These people are too bad. They've, they've caused too much pain to him and his people. They are not worthy of God's love. And he is furious that God has the audacity to reach out with mercy and compassion to this group of people. The second reason that I think Jonah is burning with rage is because Jonah realizes that his professional reputation is at risk. Does the God who gave him his noble vocation as prophet of the Lord, does he not care about how all this makes Jonah look? His professional credibility is going to be ruined. You see, Jonah went about and was asked to go and preach that God would destroy this city. And then what does God go and do? Nothing. He forgives them. If, Jonah, if, if God was going to cast down destruction, fire and damnation on this city, Jonah would have been like, woohoo, there you go, prophet of the Lord. There's the book de- deal. There's the film tour. There's everything I could want. I'm going to be the go-to prophet when it comes to destruction. Hooray. But instead, God does nothing because the people respond to Jonah's message. Jonah can't quite appreciate that maybe that in itself is a work of God but as far as he's concerned his professional credibility his reputation his vocation is being undermined so what does God do in the in the light of Jonah's anger and frustration and exasperation at the audacity of God well not 
a lot at this point. He just asks him a very simple and very short question. God says this, do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be angry? And there closes Act 1 of Chapter 4 of Jonah. And then things begin to get really weird. Okay. So, um, so after God poses that question, we cut to a new scene. And we see that Jonah is now sitting on a hill overlooking the city of Nineveh. Why has Jonah gone onto this hill overlooking the city? Um, is he just having a nice rest, reflecting, seeking the presence of God? Um, no, the implication is that he's, that he, he's still got a tiny bit of hope at the back of his mind that maybe, just maybe, God will change his mind and smite them after all. And he's waiting to see maybe, just maybe, God will do something dramatic and wipe them out. That would be such good news. But I think Jonah has accepted at this point that's not going to happen. And yet he's clinging on in bitterness and frustration to the possibility that God may do something. And it is hot. It's a hot, nasty, and pleasant place to be sat out in the sun. But then God does something rather nice for Jonah. He provides for him um, a plant. Oh, hey, no expenses spared on this today. Do you like that? That's good, isn't it? He provides a plant over, over his head. And, um, and, and this is the only time in the whole book where we see Jonah happy and content. He's delighted with this plant. It's a wonderful thing. It gives him cooling shade. He is joyful. This is the first time he's really happy and content as a person. But then God sends, in a slightly weird turn of events, a worm to gnaw the base of the tree. And what happens? The tree withers and shrivels, and Jonah no longer has any shade. And once again, we see that Jonah is furious, absolutely furious. God says to him, are you angry about the, um, the plant? And Jonah says, yes, I am. I'm angry enough to die. I said he had a dramatic flair in him. And then God says this, and this is how the book of Jonah Ends. No further response, no dramatic revelation. The book of Jonah ends with this. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I have concern for the great city of sorry, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. Thus closes the book of Jonah. So why is Jonah in the Bible, and what does it have to say to us? What does it have to speak into our situation and our lives here this evening? Well, I think part of the beauty of Jonah is that it tells a story, and it invites us, no, it challenges us to step into it and make ourselves the one who is hearing God's questions but spoken not to Jonah the prophet in this narrative but to ourselves in our own lives and our own situations. It requires an act of the imagination to enter into the role of the prophet and to put ourselves into Jonah's shoes or to put it another way to ask God if there is any Jonah-esque element deep within us. So this evening I'd love to finish by posing you three questions that I think the, the book of Jonah has posed me as I've wrestled with especially this fourth chapter. Here are three questions that I think God wants to speak to us through this strange and wonderful story today. Here's question one that it's asking me and you may want to consider if it ask, it's asking you this as well. Am I more concerned about my own comfort and needs than the reality of the world around me? God gives Jonah a plant for some relative comfort and then he takes it away. And Jonah is furious. It's the only moment we see him happy and engaged with what's going on in the whole book. And it's a brief moment of his own comfort 
and convenience. Am I sometimes so tied up with my own convenience, with them, with myself and my own problems and issues that I miss out on asking the question of what else is God up to in the wider world? Do I miss out on a deeper spiritual reality of other people and the way God is at work in their lives? Do I miss out on entering in on God's work of compassion and grace which is so core to the heart of his being and he longs for me to participate in because I'm too self-absorbed in my own challenges and despairs? That's not lessening your own challenges by the way, it's just posing the question. Jonah was so concerned with the withered plant, and yet he didn't care about the bigger picture. Maybe God wants to stir something with you to take your eyes off yourself this evening again, to look out and see things differently. Here's a second question I think the book of Jonah poses us tonight. Are there people that I exclude from the compassion and grace of God whilst assuming that his compassion and grace should always apply to me. I love it when God's compassionate and gracious to me and yet I know if I'm honest with myself that there are people, groups of people or individuals who have hurt me for whom I don't think they deserve anything of God's undeserved compassion, grace and mercy. Are there groups of people or rather individuals who have hurt you, who you internally or externally exclude from the grace and mercy of the living God. Does God want to speak into that in your life this evening, asking you to soften your heart and to somehow change something within you to begin to be softened in your being so that you can um, accept that God may want to pour out his mercy and grace on them? that you can come to a place where you can rejoice in that. Here's the third question. Am I sometimes more concerned with my own professional reputation than desiring to live out the compassion and grace of God? Now, I have this slightly weird vocation of clergy admittedly that's an odd thing to do and Jonah was a prophet I don't know what your particular vocation is whether you work in hospitality or education or in the city or in finance or in politics or in the charity sector or whatever it is that you do but in your vocation are the moments where you choose the easier path of walking away from a God of mercy, compassion, and grace in the way you do things because it may further your own career or the way you do things? Do you choose the course of um, making reputational ease for yourself over and against the difficult path of Christ-likeness? That's a question I find myself asking myself this evening. It may be one that you want to ask yourself. I'm going to pause there and these three questions are going to be up on the screen and we're going to hold a time of silence together the silence that would have sat around Jonah as he sat on the hill overlooking that city dwelling in his own anger and bitterness but for us this is a moment of silence where we invite God's spirit to enter in and to prompt us if there's anything that we need to change in response to the outpouring of love from the God, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, overwhelming in his steadfast love. When you close your eyes, I'm going to read out these questions one by one with a pause in between. And you can ask God if there's anything he wants to prompt you in your heart to respond to this evening. And then in response to this, we're going to break bread and gather around the table. That's ultimate sign of God's mercy and grace and compassionate nature as he was born among us and died on upon a cross so that mercy and grace may be known to all who desire it. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place this evening. Lord, forgive us for the times we've been more concerned 
by our own comfort and needs than the reality of those around us. Open our eyes to the suffering and needs of those you're calling us to respond to. Open our hearts to the spiritual dimension at work in this world, that you're in the business of saving souls and calling people to walk with you. Forgive us for the times we haven't been aware and sensitive to that because we've been looking inwards. But we ask now by your spirit in this silence that you'll open us up to a bigger picture, a bigger story. Come Holy Spirit and speak into that in our lives, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, soften our hearts. King Jesus, forgive us if there are people that we exclude in our own minds from your compassion and grace, whilst assuming that it should always apply to us in all circumstances. We thank you for your character. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you love to show mercy and compassion and pour out grace on those who don't deserve it and therefore you pour it out on us. And Lord, forgive us if we haven't allowed this idea of a compassionate, gracious God to apply in our minds to swathes of people, be it people groups, people from different backgrounds or individuals who have hurt us. Lord, we ask by your spirit now, you'll come and prompt us if you're calling us to change anything in ourselves Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, soften our hearts. And Lord, forgive us if we have been concerned more with our own professional reputation than by the desire to live out your compassion and grace through and in our work and workplaces. Help us to be people who mirror your character in all we do, the work we take on, the relationships we have, the projects we deliver. Come Holy Spirit and speak into this in our hearts now we pray. Come Holy Spirit.
mercy, soften our hearts. King Jesus, we gather around your table this evening. We pray that you'll reveal to us who you are afresh. May we know you as the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. May we know you as you reveal yourself to be as we come and receive this cup and this bread, these signs of our redemption and the hope we have in you again this evening. And continue to be working within us and on us as we seek your presence. In your name we pray. Amen.